Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Gary Eichten, sitting in for forum moderator Tim Hart Anderson. And it is my pleasure to welcome our guest, one of the nation's leading experts on political communication, political campaigns, political rhetoric, Kathleen Hall Jamison. Professor Jamison is the director of the prestigious Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a pioneer in uh, the field of fact-check journalism, helping create factcheck.org. She's written over a dozen books and scores of articles on political discourse, been a frequent guest on all the top radio and TV shows, including the old midday program and Minnesota Public Radio. And we're proud to say that Kathleen is one of us. She was born right here in Minneapolis. <laughs> Kathleen Hall Jamison. Welcome back home and welcome back to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. It's good to be back. Fair to say, I think, that uh, this campaign for president has been very unusual. <laughs> yes. Very unusual. Uh, have we learned anything during the course of the campaign so far? Have we been enlightened in any way or have we simply been overrun with uh, Charges, counter charges, bluster, and the rest. Could the answer be both and? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that one typically says when you say, what, what have we learned, what have we learned from the rhetoric, is here are the issue distinctions, here are the biographical distinctions, and here's how they would forecast governance. I'm going to set those aside for a moment and answer your question differently. I think an important question to ask about campaigns is, what do they tell you about the habits of mind, the tendencies of judgment of the candidates? What is it that they tell us about the people they will surround themselves with? And so I'd like to pose those as questions and then offer some data points for consideration. So for example, there are capacities that you have rhetorically when you are president. You can, for example, when the nation is in crisis, Speak for the nation. And so after a tragedy occurs, think the shuttle explodes in the Reagan administration. Think the Oklahoma City bombing. Think 9-11. Presidents stood up and delivered speeches to us as a country. And we weren't Republicans or Democrats. We were a country. We were united in that moment behind a person we may not have voted for. But that person was representing us. And in those moments, the nation did come together and came together in important ways. So a president's capacity in those moments to speak for us and to us is an important skill. And when presidents demonstrate that they have that skill, you can say, well, I may disagree with you ideologically, but in those moments, I know you will be able to step up in some important way. And that's what I mean when I say there's some rhetorical capacities that will translate into governance. Even if you disagree with the person ideologically, they're going to be important for that person to have. There's a rhetorical signaling inside the presidency that presidents have. So for example, during the crisis over the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy, a young president, is in the, the most difficult situation a president could be. We're potentially on the brink of nuclear war. And he has two different communications from the Soviets. So two different messages. And they decide in that room not to respond to the most recent one, but to respond to the one that came before. And that helped walk that situation back. Now, there were other things that happened. They engaged in diplomacy to pull some missiles out. I mean, there are other things that happened. But in that moment, there was a capacity in that room to say, I'm not going to act on the most recent. I'm not going to respond to the most inflammatory. I'm going to reframe this and we're going to respond over here. How do we know whether in those kinds of unanticipated moments a president knows how to respond and to respond effectively? And it's possible, I think, to say, I disagree with that person on all these ideological grounds. I don't like John Kennedy on this, 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 and this. But in that moment, that isn't really what's at issue. What's at issue is, does the person have the rhetorical capacity and the temperament to realize there's a way out of this and to help guide us through. What was the capacity that Ronald Reagan brought to his exchanges with Gorbachev? 
Could we have anticipated that when we looked at the, that campaign? There was a capacity there that played a really important role in the future of those two countries and hence in our well-being. How do we find a way in campaigns to find out about those kinds of skills? When a president signals to other countries with rhetoric, words matter a lot. So for example, when someone says that the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the gold standard and then later opposes it, do we have a signaling problem to those who are looking for our trade relationships that are being forecast in governance? When, for example, someone says it might be acceptable to nuclearize or to permit to become nuclearized other countries such as Japan, and then says, well, no, I didn't really say that. Do we have a signaling process? That is, what if someone heard the first, what does one make of it, and what does one make of the second? And so I think as we think about a person we're going to elect to the presidency, asking how we figure out what those capacities are, and this is not about issue distinctions per se, and what will that, how will they translate into governance becomes very important. I'd like to raise one more. I think whether a person uses evidence well is an important skill. And I think I should be able to say as a voter, I disagree with you, prospective president, on your stance on these issues, but your habits of mind, the ways in which you use evidence, qualify you in some important ways that are different if you don't use evidence well. And let me give you some possible examples. I wonder if you have a 90-some page national intelligence report and you decide you're not going to read the whole thing, what that means. Some senators did read the whole national intelligence estimate, and it was over 90 pages, and some did not. Some of those who did voted against the second Iraq war. Would those who didn't read the whole have voted differently had they. Hillary Clinton admits she did not read the whole. Now, I think I should be able to say I respect Hillary Clinton, but I wonder about that moment. I wonder about Donald Trump legitimizing a National Enquirer photo that is asserted but not established to be the father of an opposing candidate and suggesting a link to an assassination. I wonder about the uses of evidence. And I'm deliberately trying to pick an example on each side to, to ask the question, not to make an indictment, but to say, are there ways in which we can know about those habits of mind? And I worry when candidates engage in deception, in part because the electorate might misjudge them as a result. The, the electorate might vote misinformed in a misinformed way. But I worry as well because if you're willing to deceive us when you campaign, are you going to deceive us in governance? I mean, I'm of a generation that came of age during the Vietnam era. I would like to know whether we can figure out from anything available about candidates whether they are disposed to tell us the truth or not. And I remember the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. I would like to know that the candidate I'm voting for will say, there's no evidence there. I'm not going to Congress to get that resolution on those grounds. Maybe I'll go to get it on some other grounds, some other evidentiary grounds. So I'd like to start by answering the question differently from my usual answer and saying, I think we need as a country to figure out how we learn those kinds of things and how we factor them into a vote. I wanted to ask you, Kathleen, um, is Donald Trump right when he says that uh, our fear of offending others, uh, you know, our concern about playing it safe, about what he terms political correctness, that in effect that has muzzled our political speech in this country? I think we've taken some topics off the table because we have not found a way to discuss them well. And I wouldn't call that political correctness so much as an inability to figure out how to constructively engage each other on topics about which there are very strong feelings and about topics in which people are concerned that in the process of the discussion, they might inadvertently step into territory 
that will make the discussion more difficult. I think we have trouble talking about some things. Let me go back to 1988. In 1988, there is an ad that is aired that is usually telegraphed as the Willie Horton ad. The Willie Horton ad is based on a series of deceptions. The Willie Horton ad is problematic on many grounds. It's problematic in particular, in my judgment, in featuring in close-up mug shot the face of an African-American perpetrator of an actual serious crime. We didn't in 88 have a discussion about that ad that made any sense of the underlying issues. The Democrats said it's racist. The Republicans said he did it. The journalists didn't ask what was the context of that. And as a result of not identifying what it was that we were concerned about and having an engaged discussion, we never asked what are the implications of a prison furlough program. Most states have prison furlough programs, as did the federal government at the time. It still does. This was an opportunity to ask, was he furloughed illegitimately? Was there something we should put in place that is a protection we don't now have? What are the implications of tightening up a furlough system to decrease the number of people who get furloughs? We have furloughs because the social science literature says they reduce recidivism. They increase the likelihood that people who have been convicted of crime and served their time are able to go back into their community and become productive citizens. That's a good thing. That's why we have furlough programs. Instead of having the discussion about that furlough program or the benefits of furlough programs and their potential risks and the relative risk and how often these kinds of circumstances occur, we simply had an exchange that said he did it or he didn't do it. The facts are accurate or not. That happened after the election was over. Racism, non-racism, there was an element that was clearly playing on race there. But we didn't have the rest of the discussion either. And we didn't have a discussion about the race-based components either. What William Horton did on furlough was horrific. He raped a woman, he assaulted her fiance with a knife. That is horrific. It is atypical. Most crimes are committed within race, not across race. Could we have had a discussion about the typicality of it? When we don't have those discussions, I don't think it's, it's political correctness per se. I think we haven't figured out how to talk in intelligent ways about the issues that are actually consequential. And here's what happened as a result of that ad, at least in part. States reduced access to furloughs. We know in Texas specifically, because the person in charge said so, that they reduced the access to furloughs. Statistically, if you look at the number of furloughs across the United States, pre that ad, the earliest year available, and then the next available statistics, statistic on numbers of furloughs, there is a statistically significant drop in number of furloughs. How many people were not able to be integrated back into their communities productively because they were denied access to a furlough who never would have committed a horrific crime. The Horton instance, as awful as it was, was atypical. And I think we have to find a way to have these discussions because they're consequential in terms of the well-being of our country and our programming and our ability to, to engage in governance. I know what governors did when they pulled back those furloughs. They said, we might have one instance in which somebody escapes and then I'm going to be vulnerable in the same way. They shouldn't, in my judgment, have thought that way. They should have asked, what are the weaknesses and how do we address them, but not blanketly begin to pull back the furloughs. Are uh, political ads today as effective as they appeared to be in the old days? Uh, and in part, uh, this becomes a big issue because apparently one candidate, Hillary Clinton, has like 42 mil to drop into the campaign right away. Donald Trump has a million, and presumably much of that money will be spent on political ads. What the primaries have demonstrated this year is that messaging is what matters, not whether it is paid messaging. And we've actually always known that. We've just never had a candidate who is as adept at, as Mr. Trump is at securing access for messaging. In effect, when people say advertising doesn't work, look at all this advertising, and he had very little, they're not looking at all the messaging he had. Here's what happens with messaging. If I've got a strong message and my opponent has a strong message and we've got about equal volume and we're competently communicating on each side, pretty much you cancel out. 
When one side gets the microphone, the other side has a much smaller voice, assuming it's competent messaging, you get a net advantage out of it. Donald Trump did was got the messaging without paying for it, which does suggest that he's a very savvy businessman. Because how do you get people to give you their assets at no cost? Well, he figured it out. The airwaves are, 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 are there for the buying, which is unfortunately the way in which we communicate, we, we, we fund communication in this country. And he figured out how to short circuit that and get his messaging out at the expense of the networks and not pay for it. So did advertising work? Yes, he just didn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Going forward, uh, can we expect that to continue in the, in the general election campaign? No. And the reason is this. The primary electorate is a different electorate. Um, it is the, that's why you have fewer primary voters than you general election voters. Uh, they're, more, they're more partisan. They're more interested. It's part of the reason primaries tend to pull their candidates to the extremes in each party. What happens when you get to the general electorate is you have a whole lot of people who are less likely to vote but will the non nonetheless vote if you get in touch with them. Micro-targeting identifies those voters for each candidate. It just goes for those voters, and here's the problem, with messages that are often not overheard by the media so we can't catch them and fact check them, that increase the likelihood that that voter who will vote for you if the contact is made and the case is made, but otherwise just isn't gonna vote, actually votes. Without money, you can't micro-target. Getting access to cable news is not going to get to those voters. They're not high cable news consumers. And so there's going to be a problem in reaching, if your campaign strategy is to take people who are less likely to vote and increase the likelihood of, of their voting. There may be another campaign strategy, however, and it may be at play with Mr. Trump. It's very difficult, by the way, to use polls to assess any of this because we don't know how many people of those who, that sizable number that refuses to be polled, actually you know, are highly likely to vote. So response rates are at historic lows right now. And if you think a vote for Donald Trump is historically is, is, is disapproved, you're probably less likely to say you're going to support him. When you come into a poll, you might not even take the poll at all. So I'm not sure the polls tell you that much. But what we have is a situation in which the, there's a possibility that there is a large disaffected potential electorate that comes in to support a candidate who has communicated two things. He's a candidate of change, and he is strong. He has communicated those two things with his messaging to those constituencies. And his, the difference of Donald Trump is part of what communicates the change. He's violated virtually every convention you can think of, change. He engages in categorical assertion, high levels of exaggeration, change. We do focus groups with, with Peter Hart through my policy center. Peter Hart gathered a group of, of Trump supporters asked them this a few months ago, how many of them believed he'd build a wall? How many of them believed he'd actually deport you know, 12 million people? Some said, no, I don't believe he'll actually do that, but I support him anyway. What are they saying? They're saying those statements are cues that he's different, he will change. He's gonna get something more done than the rest of them who've gone there and haven't gotten anything else done. So it's possible there's a disaffected electorate that he's able to tap through mass media channels. We don't know that that's impossible. My best guess is, Micro-targeting is still going to weigh heavily in, as an advantage to the person who has more money, and that that's ultimately going to affect the electoral outcome. Has the media, at least so far, provided people with the information that they're going to need to make a decision in November uh, in terms of how this person will govern and what we can expect? Do, 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 are we getting that from the media at all? Not as much as we should, but in, in defense of the media, this has been an extremely difficult year. Uh, Ordinarily, by this time in the electoral cycle, I can tell you where the two candidates are on the major issues, where their significant clash points are, and where their similarities are. And I can tell you, as a result, what they're going to campaign from in the general election. And since I put surveys in the field, that's very helpful because I know what to ask. I can ask, do you know which candidate favors or opposes the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Both, neither, Clinton, Trump. You've got four possible choices, and the answer is neither. So usually I've got a lot of those questions, and I'm able to say the electorate should be getting more knowledgeable on those as we get closer to the election. I run surveys before and after debates. It's historically true that as a result of viewing debates, you get more of those right. As a result, they may not change your vote, but you're getting more of those right, and you're better able to forecast governance as a result. This year, day by day, the media agenda is changing. You're not getting concentrated explanations of candidates' similarities and differences. 
And that is in part a Trump phenomenon. But what we need to do is to slow down enough to get at those significant similarities and differences, and some major questions need to be put on this agenda. We just got the most recent information on it, the potential insolvency in Social Security and Medicare. It needs to be on the agenda. Candidate, what are you going to do? Where are you going to get the revenue? Are you going to increase the age of eligibility? If so, to what age? How are you going to face it? We need to know that. That's something people need to know before they vote. How many of you right now can tell me where Donald Trump is on that issue? How many of you can tell me where Hillary Clinton is on that issue? That's a failure of our media structure and our political structure. We have many important questions like that that are consequential in people's lives in which there are real trade-offs that are going to make a difference. And if, if we kick the can down the road by not addressing them at all, that problem doesn't solve itself. It just gets more insolvable. Devil's advocate, does it matter uh, what uh, the candidates say at this point on any of these issues? I mean, after all, they're not in office. They're not going to be faced with actually having to make choices, uh, you know, cutting Social Security or whatever. Uh, does it really matter, or do we, should we focus on those big picture character traits? We should do both. And here's the reason for debates. If debates do their job, they raise those issues, even if the campaigns haven't. Even if they're not speaking about it or advertising, they raise those issues. And so by the end of the debates, if those issues haven't been raised, and if a large national audience hasn't learned, then we have a failure of the debate process and the media process. And if they're raised in debates and the media do what they tend to do, which is after the debate tell you who hit an out of the ball ballpark home run, who engaged in knockout punching, nonsense, instead of reminding us of the issue similarities and differences, then they haven't done their job either. The hope that we're going to get the big issues teed up is going to be in the debates. But there is something that's really important about asking do the issues matter? Because by saying we should focus on these other characters, I don't mean to say the issue distinctions don't matter. They do. In fact, if a candidate makes a clear, takes a clear position on an issue and reiterates that position across time, the likelihood that the candidate as president will act on that issue is, is above 80%. Candidate discourse does forecast governance. That's the reason we want to understand what it is. But also, we also want to know who they are in the unanticipated moments. We need to learn both of those things. And the public is very cynical about politicians. The public thinks what politicians say and what they do has no relationship to each other. Well, it does. Historically, it is true that you can forecast a presidency out of the issue distinctions that are offered. And here's an irony. Candidates' similarities on issues across parties are the best predictor. So when you know that both candidates have the same position, Pretty likely that's what you're going to get in governance because usually the head of the ticket is speaking for the party. Now, not as clear that that's happening this year with Donald Trump. <laughs> but something else has stepped up instead. How many of you have heard of Paul Ryan's congressional agenda for the country? Paul Ryan is offering the congressional agenda and in the process, inviting those of you who are worried about Donald Trump to nonetheless vote for Republicans in Congress on the implicit promise that he's going to advance this agenda in Congress, and Donald Trump will have the choice of accepting it or rejecting, Hillary Clinton accepting or rejecting, if you elect the Republicans. So to some extent, in the absence of clear definitions from Donald Trump, Paul Ryan has stepped up and is performing a function usually performed at the head of the ticket. I would, at this point, trust that Paul Ryan's agenda is what the Republicans in Congress are going to act on if they're given return to Congress and have control in the Senate and the House. As I would trust if a candidate repeatedly articulated a position that he would try to act on it. And that's the reason, different criterion, I would like to know what Donald Trump told the New York Times about whether he was actually going to build a wall and actually try to deport 12 million people and I would like to know what Hillary Clinton said in those speeches to Goldman Sachs. Because I want to know if there's a private rhetoric that disagrees with the public rhetoric that overrides my conclusion that what they say they're going to do, they're actually going to do if we elect them. Is there, along those same lines, another campaign being conducted on social media platforms that it, you know the news media is not picking up on, frankly? Yeah, the, how many of you are following your candidate on Twitter? Could you just raise hands? 
We a have a, a smattering, <laughs> I guess, a smattering for the radio audience. Uh, a real smattering. Uh, a minuscule smattering, I think is the way to put it. One of the reasons that Donald Trump has been able to bypass the normal advertising channel is that he has so many Twitter followers. He has so many social media followers. He's essentially his own media channel. And it appears that he's going to be exploring starting his own cable channel so that he can start to make money off the fact that he's able to gain so many viewers. Now you say, what, is the, what do you know about Donald Trump? I know Donald Trump is a businessman. When I read the story that said he's thinking of starting his own cable channel because he resents the fact that all this money is going to advertising in media channels that are getting that advertising because he's driving up their ratings, I said, I know he's a businessman. What I don't know is how does that translate into governance? But it's interesting. It is different. We haven't had a situation like this before. What's happening in social media is you have a whole chain of communication from a candidate to very large numbers of people who are his followers reported by the media into the main news streams. Mr. Trump jokes that when he puts something up on Twitter, CNN says headline news, breaking news, and it moves it into the mainstream. He's not wrong about that. Those of us who are ignoring that channel of communication are missing a good part of the campaign. It's as if we're missing an advertising channel. There's also something else happening in social media that is, is a, a problem, a, kind of a, a seamy underside that, that I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about. The, the kinds of comments that you used to expect on a bathroom wall, not in your own home, in a public place, you know, the kind of, the kind of you know, adolescent vulgarity, um, anti-Semitic comments, sexist comments, racist comments, just genuinely ugly content is coming into the social media streams pseudonymously. You don't know who these people are. And to the extent that it feeds on itself, it's normalizing that kind of discourse. And we started studying this in 2008. And I, I would like to repeat something I told Gary privately earlier. I was on the phone with a reporter uh, because the, we were talking about the be very beginnings of the social media revolution. We were seeing postings that were, they were sexist attacks on Hillary Clinton. Let me feature that. Um, and they, they were statements such as, Hillary Clinton can't become the first woman president because Hillary Clinton is a man. Um, that's one I can repeat in a church. I, there, there, are, there are others I cannot repeat in a church. And I was talking to a reporter about the, the worrisome tendency inside these posts to engage in dismissive comments about women, including using forms of dismissive language that none of you would ever have used. You would never have told your children that those were acceptable. If you heard them, in my generation, it would have been, we're going to mouth, wash your mouth out with soap. Although my mother, who was about to be 99, never did that to me. <laughs> but when you see it routinely happening, it begins to normalize. So I pointed this reporter to an instance in which a person who had posted was confronted online by a young woman, she identifies a young woman, who says, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about Hillary Clinton like that. I'm not gonna support Hillary Clinton, but I don't think it's appropriate to talk about women like that. The person, male, identified male, responds back by saying, you, and then there is a word I will not repeat here, but it has four letters and starts with C. <laughs> and it escalated from there. So I said to the reporter who was talking to me on the phone, why don't you try to contact the person who posted that? The reporter did, it was a high school student. Reporter then reports the conversation in print. You'll, you'll find it if you search online. Search a Reuters article. Search my name, Reuters, you'll find this. And the young man is on the phone, says, how did you find me? <laughs> <laughs> Don't use my name, I'll never get a job or get into college. <laughs> now what does that say? That young person know that, knew that was inappropriate discourse, knew there were social penalty, penalties for engaging in it and the website came down within a week. Jump forward to this year. You are seeing fewer objections. You are seeing more normalization. You are not seeing things taken down. Candidates need to stand up when their followers are doing this on the left and on the right. There's a very interesting moment in the last election in which a woman in an audience impugns candidate Obama's, this is 2008, 
impugns candidate Obama's patriotism and country of origin, and John McCain says, no, ma'am. We disagree with him, but he's a good person. Essentially, you know, I mean, it backs this down. That is the moment that we need more of. That is people standing for boundaries of civil discourse. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Gary Eichen. Our guest is one of the nation's top experts on political discourse, Kathleen Hall Jamison, who is the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Reminder, all of our forums are free and open to the public, and you can find more information about the forum at westminsterforum.org. Time now for audience questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. And uh, while our ushers are collecting your questions, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of tonight's forum, and up in County Library with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and the online news source MinPost, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, reader-supported source of Minnesota news. Don't be shy, send those questions up. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Kathleen, uh, the level of discourse this year seems far grosser, harsher, uh, ugly, frankly, than in past campaigns. Is that just an impression or is it true? It's true. Uh, the, we, we've studied civility in discourse for a long time. And when the turnover Congress occurred, the 104th turnover, that's the Gingrich turnover in the 1990s. The Democrats had been in power for 40 years in the House. They were not happy about the Republicans being in power, and they'd exercised power for a very long time, and sometimes had exercised it inappropriately. The Republicans took over, and they decided that they were going to, you know, kind of right the balance, and the first session of the 104th hit high levels of incivility by historical norms. In the Congress, there's a taking down process. Those of you who watch C-SPAN are familiar with it. When someone oversteps boundaries, someone asks that the words be taken down, the parliamentarian rules on the words, and if it works well, the person withdraws the words. They recognize it was inappropriate in the heat of the moment, and Congress then continues. We looked at the 104th, and we were asked to create a, a document for a bipartisan congressional retreat. There were three of them. I wrote the reports for all three. Here's what we learned. We learned that the first session of the 104th hit an historic norm of incivility, name calling, impugning integrity. Jefferson's rules in the House forbid that. You're not allowed to call someone else a liar. It's an automatic taking down process. You're not allowed to impugn their patriotism or their integrity. That's, a, that's an offense under Jefferson's rules. The reason is when you do that, there's no longer a conversation. Once I call you a liar, you and I no longer have a relationship. You're now going to not trust me, and I certainly don't trust you. I just called you a liar. So if you're going to have a congressional relationship, it's got to be built on comma T. That's with a T. I said this once to a reporter, and he said comma D with a D. <laughs> and I got some very strange responses from people in the audience. But what we learned was that in the first session of the 104th, they didn't get anything done because they were being uncivil. They just weren't finding anything that was common ground. But the House of Representatives has to be elected every two years. By the second session of the 104th, before we'd even had the retreat, they had returned to historic norms. Here are some recommendations they put in place to increase the level of comedy. They stopped, they said they were going to try to stop working late at night. They were going to try to find more venues in which they spent time with each other. They were going to try to ensure that when incivility occurred on the floor, the member's own party would step up. So the offending member's own party would step up in order to quiet the situation. Part of what was fueling the rise in incivility was that the leadership was encouraging and not discouraging it. By the next session, you saw the leaders on both sides, when their member got out of control in the heat of the moment, you'd see them go to the floor and the words would be, would be withdrawn. That's a success story. Now, it doesn't mean Congress became perfect. It doesn't mean that everything was fine as a result. Things were better. The level of comity increased. They had three of those retreats to try to increase the likelihood that the institution would function productively within Jefferson's norms. We need to figure out how we do the same thing in a presidential campaign. We should not be in a situation in which a candidate for president says that the other candidate ought to be jailed, unless that person has extraordinarily strong evidence of illegal activity 
in which case, take it to the prosecutor. Take it to the police. Please save us from the menace of this illegal person. We should not, we should not have a discourse in which someone in an ad, this is, this is an independent expenditure ad, takes the words of the opposing candidate out of context in order to make it appear that the person said, I love war and I like nukes. That is illegitimate discourse. Now that's one example from each side. We need to set the boundaries on each side to say, the evidentiary requirements are such that neither one of you has legitimately warranted bridge the claim to a conclusion, you shouldn't do that anymore. Those are very, very serious charges. <coughs> and it goes back to the question, how do people use evidence? What kinds of discourse do they tolerate? What kinds of evidence do they draw? This is a very problematic year. We're seeing kinds of discourse we have not seen before at levels we have not seen before. It's going to make it more difficult for the electorate to see the issues that are legitimate, where there are issues, distinctions that are legitimate, and also, but in some ways also make it easier to assess habits of mind and temperament. Uh, audience question, how likely is it that we'll get real debates this election year? <laughs> I, I'm grateful to those of you who subscribe to factcheck.org, thank you. Those of you who don't, please do. We have a derivative site, it's also part of factcheck, called SideCheck which tries to hold people accountable when they misstate the science. Uh, if you go onto that same website, you're on the Annenberg Public Policy Center website when you come to factcheck.org. That's the reason for that plug I just offered you. We have a report on, that was created by the consultants on each side, the Democratic and Republican consultants, who guided the presidential debates through the last five cycles. And in it, they make recommendations for how we can improve debates. We, Got this report out before any of them had a candidate in the race. What we are trying to do in this report is increase the likelihood that the proportion paying attention to debates goes up. The numbers are higher in the past, but the proportion is lower than in the past. In particular, we're trying to increase the likelihood that the younger audiences and the newer audiences in the electorate, Hispanic audiences in the electorate, and also the new citizenship, the new citizen elements of the audience, are acculturated into a debate culture that is one in which there is direct clash of competing ideas. We'd like to get the moderator out of the way. We would like to make sure that the candidates tee up key issues in 15 minute blocks. And that in those blocks, they each have the same amount of time and one idea goes like this. Let's imagine that we are the candidates and the topic is what will you do to increase the solvency of social security if you believe we need to increase the solvency of Social Security. And Gary, you might start by hitting the, the, the button because you're, it's a chess clock model, and you start with your proposal. You're now being counted down. You're only, you've, got, you've got seven and a half minutes. I want to interrupt you, I can hit the bell. I can take some time. You want to interrupt, but we're gonna stay on that topic. The only function of the moderator is to make sure we stay on the topic. At the point at which you've used up your seven and a half minutes, I could have the whole rest of the time, so you're not gonna hog the time, and I'm not gonna hog the time. The likelihood we think that you'd increase the depth of the discussion on the topic is higher. We'd like to get away from the gaming. The gaming goes like this. The moderator asks a question of Gary. Gary is responding first. I get the second response. In the second response, I'm now going to rebut Gary. Gary gets the response to my response, and Gary uses it to attack me on a completely different topic. I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, because I'm going to game the system. <laughs> now notice what's happened. Now I get the next question, but I have to respond to his attack. The audience loses track of the question I was asked, and I've just been disadvantaged. Other situation, candidate gets a question, candidate misstates something, or states something in a confusing fashion. Other candidate states something in a confusing fashion, Moderator is now put in the position of having to either clarify and potentially get it wrong or stand back and the audience is confused. If either one of us had two or three more exchanges, we would go after the other and say, for example, I'll give you a classic example, did your figures on total tax relief include eliminating the estate tax? At which point you might say, yes, they did. Now we know why our figures are different. Okay? So you often have bypasses because you don't able, you're not able to go deeply enough into any topic. So I urge when you go to factcheck.org, please subscribe. 
take a look at the recommendations made by the people who have run the presidential debates, the people who advise the candidates. The commission was led by Beth Myers, who is the chief debate strategist for Romney, and Anita Dunn, who is a street chief strategist for Barack Obama. You'll see a lot of familiar names on that list. The people on that list are advising the major candidates this year. Quick follow-up on that. The debates during the primary season were, uh, especially on the Republican side, I think it's fair to say wildly entertaining. Um, <laughs> Uh, did they in any way, shape, or form meet your criteria for good debates? Because uh, I think a lot of people watched them and got involved and talked about them and so on and so forth. Yes, um, there, there were moments that clearly did. Um, again, I know this is radio, so I know I'm following all of your rules. Um, how many of you can tell me what the issue distinction between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders was on gun control? Well, we have a, f a bigger smattering. Yeah. <laughs> If you can, you probably got that clarification out of debates. They, they, the debates continued to come back to the topic. They, they, the exchanges were extended enough that there was learning there. And one candidate was trying to make that a point of issue distinction. So and we might, my test of whether it's a good debate is, did the public learn accurately something of consequence that could forecast governance? There are other moments in which journalists did a good job. So when the, I believe it was a Fox News anchor, teed up a clip of one of the candidates saying contradictory things, clip, clip, contradictory things, and said to the candidate, reconcile it. That's good journalism. Perhaps the candidate changed the candidate's mind. Perhaps there's something ambiguous in one of the statements. It gives the candidate a chance to clarify, but it also holds the candidate accountable. You had another moment in which one of the candidates uh, alleged that he would get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse in one agency to a certain percent, a certain amount, a dollar amount, and the moderator pointed out that the amount that the candidate was going to save in waste, fraud, and abuse exceeded the total dollar amount allocated to that agency. <laughs> now, that was good journalism. There was another instance in which a candidate was indicting Common Core as a federal standard, and the moderator pointed out that Common Core actually came up through the states. That's a good moment. Why is it a good moment? Because it clarifies what is at issue and puts in place an additional factual understanding. Now, the danger when moderators do that is that they're going to get it wrong. I mean, Candy Crowley tried to fact check in real time in one of the Romney-Obama debates, and she got it wrong. That's the reason you don't want candidates to do that unless you are on very, very secure policy ground where the facts are not in dispute and someone has perhaps misstated or perhaps misunderstood. All right, facts. Uh, audience member wants to know what happens when many potential voters don't care about the facts. <laughs> <laughs> the, let me tell you why you wouldn't have to care about the facts. Um, if you knew that you were a Democrat, or a Republican, and you knew that your party's nominee was a Democrat, ideologically consistent with Democratic or Republican, whichever one you are, philosophy, then the rest of it wouldn't really matter because you've anchored your vote in your philosophy and your agreement with that person's philosophy. Your only problem is going to occur if something really important to you philosophically is at odds with the candidate and you don't know it. Let me give you an example. I'm living in Pennsylvania now. We had a gubernatorial election a number of years ago in which the Democrat was the incumbent governor and the Republican was the challenger. The Democrat was pro-life. The Republican was pro-choice. Now I need fact. If I'm going to vote, on a candidate's position on abortion and use my party as the basis for the vote, I'm going to be misled. I'm actually going to vote for the wrong candidate. So there are times in which the candidate is so purely in line with the party philosophy, and your philosophy and theirs is so aligned, that you actually can simply step back and say, I'm not going to worry about the rest, unless the habits of mind are such that you might really want to disqualify them on that grounds, or there are uses of evidence you want to disqualify on, the, on that grounds. But this year, there is a problem for Republicans. Because if you're making this move, because on some things that you would assume about a Republican, Donald Trump is not allied with the traditional Republican position. So for example, if you are a free trade Republican, you will want to know 
that you and Donald Trump are not aligned. Now, that might not mean that you're going to vote for somebody else. But if it matters to you, that piece of information might be important. So when a candidate deviates ideologically from that core party philosophy, there's potentially an issue. And also, when a candidate has changed from one ideological posture to another, you may want to pay a great deal of attention to find out whether he or she is going to stay where they say they are now. There's a reason flip-flop ads are so powerful and have been used across the history of the presidency so effectively. The best was one used against McGovern. It said, this last year, this year, what about next year? And that's the problem when a candidate changes positions. I think it's fine to change positions. If you've got new evidence, change positions. Circumstances change, change positions. But what you need to understand when you're voting is that there's a compact there. You need to know where the candidate has landed and whether the candidate is giving you assurances the candidate's going to stay there if that's the issue that matters to you. Lots of uh, questions about the media. Uh, here's one. What is the role of media in our current political discourse and what should it be? I believe the airwaves are publicly owned. I would like to see free time available to candidates at a high enough level <laughs> to let the electorate understand the alternative positions. I would like the news media to realize that we are so locked into a structure that is biased toward the two major parties that we are closing out third party ideas and give third party access. <laughs> and here's the reason. Historically, third parties have churned ideas up that have been embraced by major parties. And sometimes they've churned ideas up and they've become the major party or they've redirected the major party. Uh, we now have a situation in which you have libertarian candidates on the ballot in 50 states. They are polling somewhere between 4 and 11 percent, depending on the poll that you're looking at. I think it is time for the media to say the libertarian candidates deserve interview time, they deserve Sunday time, their speeches should get some coverage. The, the audience has a right to hear what it is they have to say. And if, the, if you don't let them do that, then you require that they raise so much money that they are able to buy your attention through advertising. Mm -hmm. And it's always harder for the third parties to do that. And why would you want to put them into that crazy money structure anyway? So we're in a situation that's interesting this year. And the other night, CNN gave the two libertarian candidates, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, I believe it was a little over an hour. I watched it. I would encourage people to watch it. I think it's important to hear what they have to say. There's another reason that's important, because if you're going to, an opinion polls indicate in that three-way race now, and the polls need to make sure they're giving the alternative candidates a chance to poll enough to get into the debates, well, don't you want to hear the ideas so that you determine whether, when you're asked which of these you'd support if the election were held today, whether they even have a chance? By saying, yes, I might like to vote for this person, you're giving them the possibility of getting into the debates. The debates give them potential mass access. Even if they are not elected president of the United States, their ideas come into the mainstream in a different way. Should we expect all of our candidates to be honest all of the time? <laughs> It would be good to expect it. Um, <laughs> there, there are times in which a president of the United States can't tell the public everything the president knows. Um, so you know, full disclosure is a bad rhetorical strategy for a president. Um, there, are, there are obviously things that, that are known that should not be disclosed. They potentially endanger the country if they are disclosed. Um, that said, on consequential matters of governance, we should expect that when they tell us something is true, that they believe it is true and that the available evidence is consistent with that belief. The, the human capacity to engage in self-delusion is all but endless, and we all know that because we, we all engage in it all the time. Um, and I, I don't use the word lie, um, and we don't use it in factcheck.org because we don't think most of the time we can know what people actually think and what they actually know about what it is, the relationship it is between their belief structure and the external world. It's possible that they've just convinced themselves it is true, even though the evidence says it isn't. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't like to use the word lied. Impuse integrity in a way that I'm, I'm not comfortable with. But there are times in which you can say the evidence is there. It is clear, and we know they told us something that was the opposite of that evidence. And that's highly problematic in, the, in, behavior, in a presidential behavior, except under unusual circumstances. Let me give you an unusual circumstance. Gary Powers is shot down during the Eisenhower administration. They don't know whether or not Gary Powers has been captured. Is Eisenhower supposed to stand up and say, yes, we were flying the U-2? No, he isn't. When in the debates, Nixon is asked about any plans to invade Cuba, and I'm paraphrasing, and denies any plans, he knows there are plans. The plans that led to Bay of Pigs were formulated in the Eisenhower administration. He did not say that. He said the opposite. It was the right thing to do. You're not going to say, oh, yes, by the way, Fidel, you know, <laughs> our landing date is approximately two months after we become president. So, I mean, Tell the truth all the time, no. Engage in levels of disclosure that are consistent with facts on consequential matters, unless there's a very, very good reason not to, yes. Um, and can a candidate be elected and be honest? You're from a state in which there's been a great historical abuse. And here's the great historical abuse. Walter Mondale ran for president saying that if elected, he was going to increase taxes in order to pay down the deficit. Okay. The lesson that has been taken from that is you can't tell people the truth about what you're going to do if it's going to entail sacrifice because they will vote against you. That's the wrong lesson. Walter Mondale said raise tax in order to bring down the deficit, and the Republicans spent the entire election saying that's not what he's going to do. He's going to use it to fund new programs. At the end of the election, the electorate believed that Walter Mondale was going to raise taxes but for new programs not to pay down the deficit. So the lesson we've learned from that is wrong. The lesson is not you can't tell the truth about what you will do if it requires sacrifice. The lesson is you'd better have the communication capacity to override mistaken inferences about your promise. Another uh, question from the audience before we ramp up. Would you, Kathleen Hall Jamison, <laughs> consider moderating a presidential debate this year? <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> the, the talents involved in moderating the current debate um, are different from the talents that would be involved in the debate moderation structure we have recommended in the Annenberg Debate Working Group. In the Annenberg Debate Working Group, any person who is of goodwill and integrity, who can follow the rules and is articulate enough to complete sentences and watch a time clock would be able to moderate debates. <laughs> Given that low threshold of expectations, yes, I would be happy to moderate a debate. <laughs> Under the other rubric, no, I would not, because it requires a very high command of, of a kind of issue terrain and a question asking capacity that when executed well is the byproduct of a lot of journalistic training and a lot of journalistic talent. I am not one who says debate moderators overall have not done a good job. Debate moderators overall have done a very difficult job, very well under the circumstances, and I don't have that skill set. Can you uh, give us uh, where, where should we turn for unbiased news information? <laughs> the, I, I, don't, I don't believe in, in the concept of unbiased news information. Um, instead, I believe in a lot of people in the journalistic structure who try very hard to make sure that the knowable is communicated as well as they can. They get it wrong. It should be self-correcting. The way I think to increase the likelihood that we get that is to read across the various news outlets, in particular to read against our own ideology in the process. There's always selection in the communication process, and that human selection means there's some bias in it. We don't ever perceive it as it is. It's always filtered. But to the extent that you read the New York Times and you read the Wall Street Journal, you get alternative framing on different issues. To the extent that you read The Economist, you pick up an international perspective that is valuable. Now, because we've got internet capacity to read across outlets, we've got the ability to be more knowledgeable than ever before and to learn all those little things that one journalist might not have thought to put in. It may not have been biased, but that some other journalist thought to put in. And as a result, if you have the time, what I recommend is devoting part of one's day to reading ideologically, not simply across the news pages, but across the editorial pages. 
because you also are getting the ideological perspective, which is coherent from different points of view that are informed, even if they are informed in ways that are different from the point of view that you, you espouse. Is there anything that the folks here at Westminster, folks listening on the radio, as a practical matter can do to help shape this election campaign? Or are we subject to whatever comes down <laughs> the pike? To the extent that local culture feeds up, when local communities have candidate debates and ensure that they are good debates, when your local public broadcasting puts your candidates on, you watch and you respond positively to the station that provides that access. You're increasing the likelihood that the media structure sees that there's an audience for good substance, for substance. I guess all substance is good more or less. We, we have a situation in which when the best of our journalistic outlets give their time over, time that I believe is public airways, but give time over to candidate debates, the audiences are minuscule at the state level. They should be huge at the state level. If we're going to build a culture of civic participation where we can actually make a difference, let's start by having all the engagement at every level that we have access to, rich, informed, and you know, fully you know, activated across our entire community. You have more of that, by the way, in Minnesota than we have in some other places. Your viewership over all of these events is higher than in some other states. It's not as high as it should be. Um, but I think that's the way you, you affect change. Signaling to the system that there's an appetite for it will increase it. And we're not signaling as clearly as we should that there's an appetite for it. And that doesn't speak very well for our educational systems. We have the most educa educated electorate we've ever had in human history. The fact that it's not disposed to consume political substance when it's a little long and hence a little boring doesn't speak well for the way in which we've educated. Kathleen Hall Jamison, thanks so much for coming. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Gary Eichen. Good evening from the Westminster Town Hall Forum at Westminster Presbyterian in downtown Minneapolis. Mm -hmm.